Christianity in America. The present decline of Christianity is, I believe, weakening and restraining the influence of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> we see evidence of this in the rise of hatred, frustration, lack of trust in our fellow Americans, lack of commitment to even belief in democracy. Many people today say, oh, it isn't going to work. And we have a lack of respect for the rule of law. There is rampant rudeness, lewdness, incivility, all of which are gaining ascendancy in American culture. This is not normal, folks, nor would it have been anticipated 20 years ago. Now, much of the blame, I'm sad to say, for the current decline of civic responsibility is due to Christians themselves. The uh, so-called conservatives have tended all too often to major in the minors and minor in the essentials, and the so-called liberals have, in many cases, failed to recognize that much of what they are advocating, what they would like to see, is actually supported by biblical teachings if they would only turn to their Bible. By discounting the necessity of basing their theology on the Bible, they have undermined the source of their authority. And both groups have, by stoking discord, and all too often have they lost sight of Jesus Christ. Who could have imagined, even a decade ago, that trust in one another, respect for the rule of law, the habit of believing the best about our neighbors, all of these things which are nurtured by Christianity and which in the past have made America great would today be compromised and seemingly fading from our collective memory? Are the problems that we are experiencing in our society merely coincidental with the decline of Christianity, or is there a causal relationship, both, both ways, back and forth? What does the Bible have to say in answer to that question? Let's take a look. The Bible tells us that God has promised to bless the nation that honors him, but that God will withdraw providential blessings from the nation that does not honor him. In Proverbs chapter 1, verses 24 through 31, we read, Because I have called, and you refused, have stretched out my hand, and no one heeded. And because you have ignored all my counsel, and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when panic strikes you. When panic strikes you like a storm, and your calamity comes like a whirlwind. <coughs> Excuse me. When distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all of my reproof. Therefore they shall eat of the fruit of their way and be sated with their own devices. The lawless riots inside the Capitol building in Washington on January 6th are but one manifestation of the growing disrespect for the rule of law and if nothing else, this is a national disgrace. And it should be a warning that unless our nation turns back to God, who providentially inspired our nation's constitution, we are going to be in for an even worse humil humiliation in years ahead. Incidentally, the fact that so few of our citizens realize that the U.S. Constitution was inspired providentially by God is in itself an indication of just how much Christianity has declined in the public consciousness in recent decades. When the Spirit of God is withdrawn from a land that has abandoned God, then shall that nation eat the fruit of their own ways and be satiated with their own devices. Are we at that point, the point where there is no longer a sufficient presence of God's Spirit in our land, 
a presence sufficient to restrain the decay of values and the rise of violence and lawlessness and disrespect of others? If not, the evidence suggests that we are headed in that direction and that terrible indeed will be the consequences if we as a nation continue to turn our backs on God. 25%, the mere 25% of the population cannot by themselves sustain our covenant as a nation with the Lord. Should we as Christians be concerned? The answer to that question is most assuredly yes. Well, if so, what can the 25% do about the declining influence of Christianity in America? There are several things that we can do, including educating our children in the ways of the Lord. Now, my wife and I have friends in eastern Germany who tell of life under communism in the days before reunification. They said, our children were taught one thing at school, and at night we taught them the truth at home. And in this way, Christianity survived during the years of communist dictatorship. We may be, may well be at such a time in America, such a history, a time in history, in which Christianity, if it is to survive, will of necessity require that parents unteach secular values that are learned by our children, maybe monitor television with all of its secularism that is promoted each and every time you turn it on, and begin to teach Christian values to them at night, to unteach the things they have learned elsewhere. We must become aware and we must resist the danger posed by the encroachment of secularism. Now, church pastors must resist popular trends and work to counter the oppression of secularism by faithfully preaching and interpreting the word of God. The rest of us must support godly pastors. It is so easy to slide into a watered-down understanding of Christianity. Now, again, I'm not advocating conservative. I'm not advocating liberal. I'm saying look at the Bible, learn, see Jesus Christ, and do not part from that, depart from that. Vigilance on the part of spiritual leaders is needed in the shepherding of their flocks. I'll hazard a guess that most Christians today do not know that the vast majority of church pastors in Nazi Germany were deceived by Hitler, said nothing in opposition to him, and in many cases supported him, thrilled that Hitler's brown shirts were coming back to church. These young men that had joined this organization were coming back and bringing their sweethearts and marrying them in church. And many pastors thought, wow, Hitler may well be a good thing for the church and for Germany. Church leaders, like anyone else, are susceptible to delusion. Only faithfulness to God's word and the enduring presence of the Holy Spirit, and that element is so important. We can have the word, but unless there's the Holy Spirit, it's difficult to interpret that word that Holy Spirit in our homes and our churches is the power by which Satan's lies are staved off. Now, today I'm sounding an alarm. You and your family and your nation are, in fact, in danger. Please listen to what I'm saying with an open ear and with an open heart. The onslaught of selfishness, lawlessness, Atheism, brutality, hedonism, sounds like something out of the Old Testament, doesn't it? But it's right here in America. And these things are threatening the tried and true values in our nation today. Many churches are accommodating themselves to secularism in an effort to increase attendance and avoid rocking the boat. Many churches and their pastors have decided that God's truths are inconvenient truths. The German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of the few church pastors to actively oppose the rise of Adolf Hitler, wrote in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, quote, we have cheapened grace, and cheap grace is 
the deadly enemy of the church. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Well, there was a cost for Bonhoeffer in making statements like this. For him, his faith was not cheap. The Nazis hanged him. The problem with telling truth like it really is is that telling truth like it really is is inconvenient in all sorts of ways. Truth becomes inconvenient when a large percentage of the population no longer recognize the truth. Truth becomes inconvenient when it becomes easy to simply resist or deny the truth, replacing it with alternative facts. Demagogues who preach a more convenient alternative truth make it easy and acceptable for the populace to simply ignore the truth. True Christianity, as modeled for us by Jesus, has become an inconvenience for many people today. And inconvenience has become an unacceptable thing for many of our fellow citizens. The following are actual responses from comment cards given to park rangers by visitors at a wilderness recreation area. One, the visitors have said this and the, as they went into and spent time in this wilderness recreation area. One, trails need to be reconstructed. Please avoid, avoid building trails that go uphill. All right, two, too many bugs and leeches and spiders and spider webs. Please spray the wilderness to rid the areas of these pests. These are actual comments. Three, please pave the, tail, the trails. Chairlifts need to be in some places so that people can get to those wonderful views without having to hike to them. Four, the wolves made too much noise last night and kept me awake. Please eradicate those annoying animals. Five, a small animal came into my camp and stole my jar of pickles. Is there a way I can get reimbursed? Please call me at. And six, a McDonald's would be nice at the trailhead. Now, these comments and these complaints indicate that the persons who made them did not really understand what it means to stay in a wilderness camp area. They were looking for something convenient and comfortable, but not truly really a wilderness park experience. In similar fashion, many people today do not understand what it means to be a Christian. They do not feel that it is important to be a Christian and consequently have no real desire to be practicing Christians. Instead, they're looking for something a bit more convenient. And I find this frightening. And I believe that it bodes poorly for the future of our nation. One day, a young disciple of Christ, who wanted to become everything that God had in mind for him, visited the home of an elderly Christian seeking his advice. He had heard that this old man had never lost his love for Christ in all the years that he had known the Savior. Now, the old Christian was sitting on the porch with his dog stretched out before him, taking in the beautiful sunset. And the young man asked a question. Why is it, sir, most Christians zealously chase after God during the first year or two after their decision to follow him, but then fall into the complacent ritual of merely attending church once or twice a month and end up losing their passion for the Lord? And the young man continued, I've heard you are not like that. I've been told that you have frequently and fervently sought after God throughout your years as a Christian. And people see something in you that they don't see in most people who claim to be Christians. What makes the difference? Well, the old man smiled and replied, let me tell you a story. One day I was sitting here quietly in the sun with my dog. Suddenly a large white rabbit ran across in front of us. Well, my dog jumped up and took off after that big rabbit, and he ch chased the rabbit over the hills with passion, and soon other dogs joined him, attracted by the barking. And what a sight it was as that pack of dogs ran barking 
across the creeks, up stony embankments, and through thickets and thorns. Gradually, however, one by one, the other dogs dropped out of the pursuit, discouraged by the course and frustrated by the chase. Only my dog continued hotly to pursue that white rabbit. And that story, young man, is the answer to your question. Well, the young man sat in confused silence. And finally, he asked, I don't understand. What is the connection between the rabbit chase and the quest for God? You fail to understand, answered the older man, because you failed to ask the obvious question. Why didn't the other dogs continue on the chase? And the answer to that question is that they were only joining the excitement of the group. They had not seen the rabbit. Unless you have actually seen the rabbit, the chase is just too difficult. You will lack the passion and the determination necessary to keep up the chase. And this brings us to the pertinent point of my sermon this morning. Have you seen the Lord? Have you really seen him? Do you realize and accept that he's carrying the cross for you? And do you wish for other people to see? And are you willing to work at it, to go out and to share that, that they might also see? Do you understand what it means to be a Christian, that you are being asked to carry a very inconvenient cross for the benefit and the well-being of others? And in order to carry that cross, in order to endure the inconvenience of Christian ministry, of actually following Christ, the first prerequisite is that you actually see the one whom you are seeking. You must abandon your delusions and instead focus upon and truly see what is truly true. If America is to avoid the withdrawal of God's providential favor, it will be necessary for more of us to see the Lord in the days to come. We will need preachers who themselves truly see the rabbit, so to speak, and are willing to pursue the chase regardless of the difficulties ahead. If our nation is to survive the rising tide of secularism, which threatens to tear it apart, we will need preachers who will open themselves to God's word and open that word to us and their preaching with integrity. A time for decision has come upon America. The failure of our nation to decide for Christ is already costing us dearly, and the result of future failures will be humiliating at best. My challenge to each of you today is to understand that this situation is serious and that we must take our Christian responsibilities to heart. That is not to say that the situation is beyond repair. As the song that the choir sang today said, if we will but walk within God's light, he will guide each step that we take. And if we put our trust in him, we will see a brand new day begin. Let's start now to work toward that new day.